Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for Impact 102. This is unifying healthcare, health research, and patients through data. My name is Erin Chu and I'm the life sciences lead for the AWS Open Data Team. I am honored to be introducing and mediating an awesome conversation between our three speakers today. So very briefly, just so you know what you're in for for the next 60 minutes, I'm gonna take you through a very quick introduction. It's not gonna be very uh, interesting compared to my speakers, but it'll set the stage for why we are all here today. We'll then go into a series of lightning talks. Shri, Shoab, and Michael will introduce you to their organization and give you a little understanding of where they are in their transition to cloud. And then we'll move into some interactive discussion. I like to think of it as a fireside chat, mostly because we have these fantastic armchairs. At that point, I would love if anyone in the audience would like to come up to the microphone if you have any questions uh, for our speakers, and we'll be happy to address them at that time. And we'll just finish up with some closing remarks just so that you have something nice to take away with you. So let's just focus on the fact that we are all here because research is changing in this era. First of all, we know it's growing, not just the size of the data that we're working with, but the size of the workloads associated with analyzing those data. We know that our research is becoming increasingly global. We have collaborators all over the world who are often working towards the same mission and need to access the same data with the same pipelines and the same tools, sometimes at the same time. We know our data are becoming more diverse. 10, 20 years ago, no one had a Fitbit. Nowadays, we're trying to integrate wearable data, mobility data, genomic data, everything is changing and we need to make sure our workflows are flexible enough to handle those different kinds of data. And finally, people are accessing these data for perhaps different purposes for which the data were built. Machine learning applications, business analytics and intelligence, these are all different applications for which the same pool of data might be accessed. So what does this mean? as we are phasing into this new era of research. The power and capacity that we might have on premises for today's data may simply not be enough. If our global consortia are truly global, we could probably benefit from globally distributed resources. And if you are working with data for different purposes, you could benefit from proximity to lots and lots of different tools. So, with that in mind, I want you to think about flipping the flow of traditional research with cloud. And for those of you who have been in the industry for a long time, traditionally you know that we are pulling down data and working with it typically locally, whether it's on your laptop, if you happen to have a really nice laptop, or if you happen to have rented some space on your university or your institution's uh, cluster. Now I want you to think about flipping that and bringing your resources to the data. All of a sudden, that means that you can bring analytics like Amazon Athena, compute like Amazon EC2, as well as purpose-built tooling and solutions like Amazon SageMaker for machine learning or the Amazon Genomics CLI right to your data, and you only pay for the resources that you use. Now one thing that I wanted to really emphasize here and that's missing in this right now is ultimately we are trying to bring these capabilities to our scientists, our collaborators in the clinic, and most importantly, the patient. So what you're gonna hear today are three groups that are really accommodating that ecosystem of researchers, clinicians, scientists, patients, um, and, and really empowering them. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Shri Peria Kripen, who is our Senior Director for Data Engineering at the American College of Radiology. Thank you. Oops. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'm Shri Peria Kripen, and I head the Data Engineering and Analytics Group at American College of Radiology. I mean, ACR is a membership-based organization with over 41,000 members across the world. And they are primarily, you know, uh, I mean, radiologists, like interventional um, and, and diagnostic radiologists, and, all, and also we have like medical physicists and medical physicians. Um, we've been in the industry for over 100 years. I mean, empowering our members to advance the practice, science, and professions of radiological care. I mean, as you can see, 
We have a number of different programs at ACR. Under the quality and safety, we have the accreditation program, where we accredit, um, I mean, radiology equipments, like, um, I mean, mammograms, scanners, and things like that, for over 21,000 connected facilities across the United States. We also run a lot of educational programs to basically help our members, um, I mean, continue their education throughout their career. We also have a large clinical trial institute where we basically collect terabytes of medical imaging and clinical data sets, and then we basically curate them uh, and then redact them and then make it available for the researchers for the research for, for the research use. We also have a large informatics division. Under the Data Science Institute, um, we run a lot of AI and ML programs to, I mean, which basically shapes the radiology, uh, I mean, the future of radiology. We truly consider ourselves to be the voice of radiology, and we work with our members to set the the, the health policies and standards. Prior to moving to AWS, our infrastructure was pretty complex. As you can see, we have um, a lot of different applications, and our entire data journey began with a few simple questions. The first of it being, how many customers do we have? It seems to be a very simple question, but it was very difficult to answer because our customer base are not just radiologists. We have hospitals, private practices, academic institutions, um, and also technologists, et cetera. I mean, across these various different applications we have, we have, we have over 150 different applications. The customer data was basically embedded in all of those applications, and it was really difficult to kind of dedupe and find a unique customer across all of these applications. We had a lot of data silos and a lot of data duplication, and we being a healthcare company, we had to strictly follow the HIPAA regulations, so we had a very complex network segmentation. So if we have to move the data from one network segment to another, we had to go through a lot of standard, uh, I mean, standard operating procedures. So, at the end of the day, doing the analytics was not a problem. The biggest challenge for us was to get to the data in order to do the analytics. So how did we overcome this particular problem? A couple of years ago, we decided that we want to completely change the way that we operate our environment. So we came up with the Customer 360 initiative, for which we did a number of different projects simultaneously. The first thing is we moved our customer databases to a CRM. We were, using, uh, we were using Salesforce Nimble. Then we truly wanted a data warehousing platform where we could run our analytics efficiently. Uh, we did our research and finally trusted AWS to be our partner and we created our data lake in the AWS. Most of our business units are not SQL savvy. So even though we bring the data to a single location, we needed uh, different tools to enable them to draw insights, and we decided to use Tableau for the business intelligence piece. In order to get precision outreach to our customers, we, uh, we embraced ourselves with Marketo. And finally, to seamlessly access all the ACR applications, we embedded a single sign-on uh, and we enabled a single sign-on in all our applications, and we used Okta for that purpose. If we look at our current ACR landscape, we have you know, our entire customer database in Salesforce, and we now move the data from Salesforce into our data lake on a nightly basis, and we use AWS, uh, I mean, AppFlow for that purpose. And we also move all the all the data that is, I mean, all the data that are, that we need to utilize in the analysis from our various operational systems into the data lake using uh, DMS. And 
the most important factor that we need to consider when we create a data lake are the ETLs. So we were very careful in standardizing our ETLs. Basically, we um, standardized the ETLs that, I mean, I mean, some of the fields, like all the date fields were standardized in a certain format. And then we also standardized the demographics, like you know, patient uh, gender, patient names, all to be of a similar format. So this kind of solved uh, about 70% of our problem on standardizing the ETLs. Now we have a data lake where we can have a single source of truth for our analytics, and we can have various uh, data governance rules can be placed on top of this single source of truth. Um, and you might ask, like, how long did it take for us to build this entire data lake? So we first had to build um, the landing zone. So we used control tower to build the landing zone. And then we built the data lake. It took about three to four months for us to build the data lake. Um, this entire, the entire ecosystem uh, went live about three months ago. And currently we have over 500 reports and 500, I mean, about 500 Tableau, Tableau dashboards that are running on top of the data lake. So thank you so much, I mean, AWS, for giving us this opportunity to come and share this success story here. Thank you. Got it. Thank you so much, Sri. For our next speaker, I'd like to welcome Shoaib Muthi, who's our head of data and technology at the Allen Institute. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. And uh, thanks thank to all of you for spending uh, your Wednesday. Uh, can you hear me? I think you can hear me. Uh, uh, your Wednesday afternoon with us. I know it's like 4 o'clock. Probably we are between all the fun activities in Vegas and, <laughs> and, and this thing. So, um, so I'm, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I lead the data and technology team at Allen Institute for Brain Science. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of, of our focus on uh, uh, in Allen Institute, but also talk a little bit about a really special project we are working on, which we are very excited about it and how you're using data and cloud technologies to, to further that, that project. So this moves. So just a, a quick overview of Allen Institute. Uh, we are institute that's, uh, that's in Seattle. Uh, we were founded uh, by Mr. Paul Allen, uh, who co-founded uh, Microsoft with Bill Gates. And due to his generosity, the whole institute started. Uh, so typically, our focus is to work on hard problems, the way we think about it, the grand challenges. Uh, so the, our approach is that there's a lot of great work, research going on all across the nation, all across the world, uh, but, uh, but there's some really, really big problems, and that requires a lot of resources to bring together. Uh, and, and our model is that let's work on those hard problems. So we don't work on a lot of problems, but we work on few problems, but typically they are pretty hard to, to work on. Uh, most of the work which we do are driven by three core values we have. One is the big science, which is the hard problems I mentioned. Uh, the other thing is that what we believe is this philosophy around team science, uh, because we believe that these hard problems cannot be done by a single organization or single institute. So we're trying to bring a whole community together on the problems we tend to work on. And, and that last but not least, which is really very really important tenant for us, is the open science. Uh, whatever we do, we want to share it. So all the data we produce, all the tools we produce, we openly share with, with the community. You go to a website, you don't even have, need to log in to our website. You can just download stuff there. Um, so in addition to doing science, uh, one of the big focus we also have is around technology. Uh, so, so we do a lot of investment around producing data sets, building tools, and, and building knowledge around those tools. So uh, if you look at our history, so we started in 2003. Since then, we, every year, we are producing new tools and technologies. Uh, our resources are used by millions 
of researchers and thousands of educators. Uh, all of the work, the technology work we do has been cited in hundreds of thousands of publications. And uh, the website we have, uh, it has hundreds and millions of page views and over one million unique visitors every year. So uh, uh, now let me talk a little bit about the project, which I'm very excited about it. And uh, really, where cloud and data, t data scaling is really uh, playing a key role. Uh, the project we are working on is to, to really reverse engineer the entire human brain. Right? As you know, human brain is the most complex organ in, the, uh, in, in a human body. So we're trying to figure out you know, how to reverse engineer the human brain. And the reason we want to uh, reverse engineer the human brain is mainly driven from a disease side. Uh, because uh, as you know, of, of those of you who have been following the uh, development on the drug side, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of heartbreak going on in terms of brain-related drugs, right? Around Alzheimer's, other things. A lot of drugs that came about, they look very, very promising in the initial phase. But in the final phase, the efficacy is not uh, that much. The question is, why is that happening, right? Why, why is this, uh, this thing is happening right now? And I think there are several factors that sort of contribute uh, to that, right? So, so obviously, we don't understand the disease mechanisms. That's one of the big things. Um, also, we can really deliver targeted cures, right? So we give medicine with a general purpose. Sometimes they work, but also... They have a lot of like, side effects as well. Uh, since we don't have a lot of information on, on the human brain, uh, we tend to use other species for that research. Like, for example, we use mice. Uh, we use other, other, other species. And, and some of the work, the research work that's done there is not really going to translate there. But I think the main cause for us not curing the brain disease the reality is that we don't understand the brain, right? So that's, that's, that's the main thing. So unless you under, understand the underlying system, you cannot really cure what's going wrong with, with it. So the question is how we go about doing that. I think I have to use this one. So, uh, so in order to understand brain, uh, you have to divide into components. For example, if you're trying to understand a system that c doesn't come with, with a manual, right? <laughs> I pick up a phone on the street and try to understand what's going on in this phone. So in order to understand it, I open up the phone. I need to understand what the components are, what the connections are, and maybe I'm smart enough, I can pass some signals through it and try to, try to understand it. And that's exactly what we are trying to do with the brain. We are trying to understand the components, what are the components, what are computation mechanism, what are the cognition mechanism, and, and try to understand the basic, basic elements of the brain and the connections between, between those elements. <laughs> this doesn't, okay. So, uh, so how uh, we are trying to uh, do that, right? So, so, so the way our approach is that, uh, is that let's bring all the brain-related information at one place. And, and so the project we are working on is called Brain Knowledge Platform, which is a great unifier of all the brain information. So it's not, it doesn't just have data, but we are trying to connect it with the publications, what's published uh, around brain, we are trying to do like web scraping around it. And brain has like 200 billion cells. So it's so all, you know, how to figure out all those 200 billion cells. So, so that's the, the grand challenge project we are working on. And as you can think about it, that doing an undertaking of this size where you unifying all the neuroscience information cannot be done in a, in, a, in a mainstream data center. So you have to you have to think about a computing and storage infrastructure that can scale, maybe scale endlessly, right? And this is where the cloud comes into play. So, so I think that's where we are so excited about, you know, using cloud technology so we can scale at this thing. And the inter interesting thing about this, this project is that it's not just 
scaling the data itself, right? Which is a lot of it. But how you can sort of overlay a knowledge layer on top of it, so you can make sense out of the data. You can look at one piece of data and make sense out of that from the other piece of data and connect them together. So this is where a lot of like interesting technology that's getting developed in cloud around machine learning, other things that's coming into, into play. And we are very grateful for partnerships happening there. It takes two times to click on this thing. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so, uh, so we are starting with Brain, which is our main, main focus right now. But the system we are building, we believe it can really scale, right? So the next frontier could be, instead of Brain, you can start to think about other organs as well. Um, maybe you can bring heart into this, this system which we are building. Maybe you can bring lungs to the. Ultimately, you can build a system around whole human biology to some extent. And then, of course, you can connect with the medicine and all that information together. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, you need a massive infrastructure to do, to do this undertaking. We are the starting phase. We are in the first inning of this. Uh, but we can see the path. And we are very excited about it. Uh, thank you for, for listening. And thanks for your time. Awesome. And last but not least, I'd like to bring Michael Hun to the stand, uh, who is our CEO and founder of the EB Research Partnership. Thank you. Hello, reInvent. How are we doing? Good to be with you in the Venetian Theater. I was told this was the home of the Phantom of the Opera for many, many years in Vegas. So if you see the chandelier start to slide, or you see the Phantom, up in the balcony or you see one of us fall through this trap door, don't be too surprised, okay? Um, just to start with a quick poll, show of hands, how many people in this room know somebody who has a rare disease? Okay, so about, about more than half of the room knows somebody with a rare disease, which is no surprise. Rare diseases, by definition, are very small groups and communities that have a specific disease, but in aggregate, 10% of the planet has a rare disease. That's 400 million people. That's more people than cancer and HIV combined have a rare disease. Yet 95% of rare diseases have zero approved treatments. 95% of 400 million people. That's an addressable market. That's a big world problem worth solving. So what do we do at EB Research Partnership? We're one of those rare diseases. Epidermolysis bullosa, we'll use EB for short because it's much easier to say. EB is a life-threatening genetic disease that affects children from birth. This is my friend, Salim. So all of us in this room, when we're born, if we get a scrape or a wound, Collagen 7 flushes in and our wounds are able to heal. Kids that are born with EB have one genetic mutation that prohibits their skin from healing. Now remember, skin is the largest organ in the body. So for kids like Salim, life expectancy is 1 to 30 years old and life is full of bandaging and bleach baths and hours of doctor's appointments. Kids with EB are called butterfly children because their skin is as fragile as the wings of a butterfly. So what's the good news? EB is a monogenic disease. That means EB is caused by one genetic mutation that we've discovered. So we have hope, we have optimism, we have a scientific community behind us. We were founded 10 years ago by a group of dedicated parents set out to save their children's life, along with Jill and Eddie Vedder, lead singer of the band Pearl Jam, so it helps to have a rock star in your corner to raise your platform. And we've made remarkable, unprecedented progress. When we started a decade ago, there was two clinical trials, not a lot of hope, not a lot of optimism. We've raised $50 million, we funded 120 projects, and now there is nearly 40 clinical trials, half of which we directly funded, and for the first time ever, four phase three clinical trials. So next year, two, thank you. Next year, two of those are up for approval. So we seek to cross into that 5% of rare diseases that actually do have an approved treatment. Uh, and we've done that via a really innovative business model. So our mission, and this is shared by the medical and scientific community, our big, bold, audacious goal is to cure EB by 2030, by the end of this decade, and in the process, pioneer a business model via venture philanthropy investing in technology, which we're gonna talk about today, that can be scaled to the 400 million people with a rare disease. So, our curator platform. Data drives decisions, decisions inform strategy, 
A good, effective strategy helps us all create impact for the missions that we serve. For us, what are our goals of leveraging technology? What are our, co our goals of building a technology platform? Number one, patient empowerment. Give patients agency, give patients choice, give patients the power, give patients the role in the driver's seat to control their data, decide on who they share it with, and to have a feedback loop where they get their data, they own their data, they're part of the process. Number two, overcome barriers to approved treatments. In rare diseases, why don't we have more approved treatments? Number one, it's hard to find patients, right, for clinical trials. It's hard to recruit patients for these rare diseases. A phase one clinical trial may have five patients enrolled, and it may take years to find those patients. So just finding and consolidating and aggregating, aggregating the patient communities. And number three, community building. You know, we don't have curated platforms in healthcare and disease today. People go on social media, and I'll give you an example of, of why that can be challenging. EB can range from a life expectancy of one year old to 30 years old to a form that's not even life-threatening. So a parent goes on social media, they have a child with a non-life-threatening version, and they see a parent post an article that their child just passed away at one years old. That's not curated, that's not backed by medical professionals. So building community, but having that overseen by medical data and medical knowledge. When building healthcare apps and platforms, the number one most important lesson that we've learned is partner with good academic medical centers. I always make the argument, education and healthcare are the last industries to be disrupted by technology. Why is that? They're slow, they're bureaucratic, they have a lot of compliance, and those are mainly for good reasons, right? But it can stifle innovation and technology. We work with the team at the, the Stanford Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine. That's my favorite thing to say. My favorite thing to say because it's not us, you know, as CEOs and executives saying that. These are the PhDs and the MDs using words like definitive and curative. So that's the team that we partner with. Every single idea that we come up with and say it'd be great to have this in the platform, it'd be great to have that in the platform. An institutional review board at Stanford reviews every single step to make sure we're compliant, HIPAA compliant, uh, that there's safety and security. It's a really key learning experience. So why did we build what we build? Uh, we partnered with AWS and GeneDx, the largest rare disease genetic company on the planet, and we got in one room patients, parents, university bioinformaticians, MDs, PhDs, biotech and pharma executives, and we said, we're not leaving this room till we emerge with a one-sentence problem of what technology can solve. And what we emerged with that room was, was what if navigating your journey with a rare disease could be as easy as entering a destination in your GPS, except the right and left turns are the right treatment for the right patient at the right time? So this is what we've built. We went out and we looked what data exists, you know, genomic information. And by the way, you know, we figured out a way that we can put speed and acceleration into this. We don't need to go to academic medical centers. And I love them, but they can be siloed, they can be publisher parish, it's really hard for even a patient to get their data. So we said, let's go to the home of patients. We can mail a Gene DX kit to their house, they swipe their cheek, they send it back to Gene DX, and Stanford gives them a one-on-one -on -one genomic consultation, and they can decide who they share that information with. Do I share it with academics who are working on a treatment or a potential cure for my disease? Do I share it on biotech and pharma companies that are potentially working on a therapeutic for my disease area? They have the power, they have the choice ecosystem data, public available information. We made an open API with clinicaltrials.gov, PubMed, EHRs as part of uh, clinical trial networks. You know, how can we integrate this data with the patient saying, I want my data released into this platform, and it follows them around like a passport when they go to specialist, to specialist, specialist. All this data is in one place. And most importantly, patient reported outcome data. And the FDA has put an increasing emphasis on this in recent years. What do the patients think? How do the patients feel? What do patients want? So survey data. And what do we do? We aggregate that on a beautiful AWS S3 cloud system, and a clinical research consortium of 20 approved academic medical centers can use that data to inform their research. Biotech and pharma companies and the FDA that doesn't understand a lot of rare diseases because there's 7,000 of them, right? So we can provide this data to companies. We can help recruit for clinical trials. We can inform the FDA on longitudinal data. And the secret sauce, and this is the biggest thing that technology uh, apps don't do in healthcare, that, that patient portals don't do within hospitals. We always forget about what? The patient. 
get the data back to the patient. What data can we give to patients on longitudinal population level health data that can inform their journey with the disease today? I always say good UX is not something that we often say synonymous with healthcare. You know, there's not a lot of beautifully designed products in healthcare. So we talk about and we coined the term patient behavioral science. If you're a parent and you have a child with a rare disease, your life is very, very busy and burdensome. So how can we make this as easy to use on all the other apps that you use on your phone? Beautiful data. You know, a patient logs in and the first thing they see is where are all the patients and families like me across uh, the planet? Can I connect with them? Because, you know, we learn a lot from science and research, but parents that have a child with a rare disease oftentimes are the biggest sources of information for one another, right? Connect those families with other families that uniquely understand the experience. So if we can do this, what does that mean? If we can leverage technology to accelerate treatments and cures for EB, it means hours spent on bandage changes and bleach baths and doctor's appointments and pain and suffering can be converted into time back to kids and families so they can go on vacations, they can be a kid. Time is the most valuable asset that we have. So if we can do this, it will accelerate our timeline of curing this disease by 2030 and pioneering a model that can be leveraged for the 10% of the planet that has a rare disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Michael, you beat me to the punch because my first question to the audience was going to say, how many of you have had an MRI or a CT scan or an X-ray in your life? A lot of people. And how many of you have have a family member or a friend who has been affected by neurodegenerative disease. Also me. So these are problems that all of us see and face every day. Um, and so I'm just so honored that we have three people who are driving these fields forward with us today. Like I said, please feel free to come uh, to the microphone. We can see you through the blinding lights if you have any burning questions. But otherwise, um, I'm going to jump uh, to some diagrams. So you'll laugh, but when these three speakers came to me with their decks originally, they all had these incredibly <laughs> complex diagrams. And I said, well, we could talk about them uh, in your presentations, or we could use them as discussion points. Um, and so I think Shri had uh, on a previous slide a, a box that said AWS Data Lake. So this is actually an expansion of that box into what actually underlies the data lake. And Shri, I know that you were really the driving force be behind the ACR's embracement of the data lake. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to you know, what you have stood up right now and, and the benefits of having the data in this model. Sure. I think one of the, uh, I mean, one of the main reasons why we wanted a, uh, I mean, why we wanted like a data warehousing I mean, solution immediately was because of the Salesforce integration. Um, we all love Salesforce, but at the same time, uh, it has its own advantages and, and a lot of disadvantages to it. I mean, in the sense, um, Salesforce themselves say that, please do not store historical data on our platform because it's pretty, pretty expensive. So we had to find a solution so that uh, we retain only the data that we need on the operational system, mm -hmm. um, and then move all the other historical records into another area where we can quickly merge those data sets with our other assets in order to, in order to derive insights. So uh, whatever we had to do, we had to do something quickly. Um, and, uh, and that is one of the primary reasons why uh, we wanted to create a data lake as opposed to a data warehousing solution. Um, a lot of people ask, the, uh, I mean, ask me, what's the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse? The way I would, uh, the way I would describe that is a data warehouse is still very structured. Um, you would need a DBA or you would need a data portion to actually uh, curate the data and actually load the data into the data warehouse. Whereas a data lake is, you can just throw uh, the data in an object format and you can quickly query the data sets. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made a lot of sense for us to use the data lake because we could get data in any raw format and we can also standardize, and, and it also gave us a way to standardize our, our ETLs. And um, I mean, if you look at the diagram right here, we have three different buckets. We have a raw layer, we have a curated layer, and we have a consumable layer where all data, be it from uh, Marketo or be it from Salesforce, 
or all or any of our other operational systems data get into the raw into the raw layer and we immediately uh, convert them into parquet files mm -hmm. and we've had great benefits using parquet files and we've we've in fact reduced costs quite a bit because of using the parquet file file format and at the same time we run this and then uh, the parquet files get into the curated layer and then we apply business logic and standardize ETLs on top of the curated layer and only the consumable layer is available for people to use. Um, and then whatever is in the consumable layer that we are confident about that that's not going to change, those are actually uh, sent into Redshift. So we still have a data warehousing solution because we don't want to keep the data in the lake and pay for Athena <laughs> to, to run every single query. So the standardized data sets are then slowly moved into, into Redshift. And uh, Tableau actually talks to Redshift um, for most of its, uh, I mean, for most of the reporting needs. We also have Tableau talking to Athena, but, but, just, but those are just previews. You know, so I think we have, a, a, I mean, a solid environment. I mean, AWS has given us a solid platform to uh, quickly embrace the cloud, cloud uh, technologies um, and the SMEs and the SAs have really helped us because there's a lot of reusable code yeah. um, and a lot of services were built and, you know, there were a lot of GitHubs that were available that we could actually reuse and, uh, you know, slightly tweak and make it happen. Yeah. So, so thanks to AWS. Oh, well, thank you for entrusting us to help you build. Right. Um, and speaking of which, I'm going to press the button. Um, you know, you, you brought up some really important things there, which was reusable code, reusable tooling, mm -hmm. reusable data. Um, and for those of you who, I love that the screen here is enormous because this is an incredibly complex diagram. <laughs> So, you know, I could spend 23 minutes just talking about this, and this is something that we are all so excited about with in our collaboration with the Allen Institute. Uh, but this was the brain knowledge platform that Shoaib alluded to in his talk. And what I want you to focus on here is that like 50% of this diagram speaks to allowing researchers to bring their tooling to the data. And show up, you know, when we talk about diverse data types and accommodating the research community who also have diverse tooling, like how is the Allen Institute really trying to bring in the community? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good, good uh, point, Aaron. And I apologize for this really, really messy diagram. I wanted to put in my initial presentation, but I found another messy picture to put there. <laughs> so, so, but, but I, I think this kind of shows the complexity of, of the challenge we have, right? So if you think about it, right, at, as a center, we are trying to build this kind of centralized database, uh, but, but it's just not like, uh, you know, organizing the data, building a database, building a knowledge base, but it's how you sort of bring all this data together, right? Because the data sources are diverse, right? So. There must be some data which is sitting in the search community. There's data sets uh, which we produce ourselves. Uh, and then there's a lot of like, clinical data out there, right? To, so how do you sort of bring, bring everything kind of uh, together? So that, that's, that's, a, that's a very, very challenging task in general to think about, not just about the database architecture, but the data integration architecture. So, so this is uh, where uh, we are trying to think a lot about it. There's, there's a lot of tooling we are trying to develop, co-developing, thinking with, with Amazon about, about those things too. But also it's, it's a kind of social experience too, right? So how you sort of build that trust with the community, right? They, they're willing to give you data. They make you a trusted partner. So we have been fortunate enough that, you know, uh, we work closely with NIH, the community, they support. So, so we get a little bit leg up. We participate in, in the grants there. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you're a researcher, you have to trust that you know, you're bringing your data somewhere, A, you are going to get value, and the B is that it's going to be used for a good purpose, right? So that's kind of our environment we try to create. And, and, and for us, the big thing is that we make it open, right? So, so of course, you can contribute, but it's open, right? So you can download what we have to, right? So, so it's a two-way street we try to build to build that trust. And one more point I just want to say, like in the end, is that uh, it's not, uh, so I talk about data integration, I talk about database, uh, but also it's a data discovery is also a really, really important aspect because the space we are in, 
uh, we really don't know what we are looking for a lot of times. Like we are trying to uh, discover a new cell in brain. So you don't know where that cell is, what, what the cell is about. No one has ever discovered. So, so we want to create this kind of aha moments, right? Where you kind of have a hypothesis, you have kind of a notion about you know, what you're looking for, but we are really no, not sure. So we try to build this kind of knowledge graph, building facilities around inferencing, around machine learning, to make sure that you, know, you can look at one data set and find new information, and then these kind of aha moments happen for our researchers. But that's a great point. I think building the community, building the community trust is a key part of the overall picture. Yeah, and I would agree too, is the community in one size is just not gonna fit all. Yeah. Um, every researcher has their favorite coding language, just like all of us have our favorite brand of peanut butter or uh, our favorite, you know, favorite grocery store brand. And Shri, I'm wondering, you know, as you work with clinical researchers all the time, what kind of uh, flexibility you've, you've been able to provide them? Yeah, we've had some really challenging issues because um, when you talk about uh, the clinical research side, there's a lot of SaaS users, traditional SaaS users. Um, so there was one day when I went to the SaaS group, one of the groups, and I basically told them, I mean, SaaS is such an old tool, you guys should probably move on to like R or uh, Python. And you know, it was not well, well received at all. <laughs> and then I, I was actually thinking about it. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to force a tool onto a group uh, because they've been working on it for so much for such long periods of time, mm -hmm. and that, that is great about how we do um, how we store store data and how we utilize the data today. Because gone are the days where we have to port the data to the tool which we want which we want to use. Um, but now we have one environment, and now we have so many different connectors. For example, I have a lot of uh, data analysts and, and the business users who log into Athena to query the data, which is in the data lake. We also have data scientists who would use like SageMaker yep. and like RStudio in order to run their analytics. But most of the business users, right, uh, either, they, they're not that technical savvy. I mean, that being said, we, we uh, made sure that we have a tool for them and they use Tableau, and Tableau has something called as Ask Data. They can, you know, which is like a natural language. You can ask Tableau, and Tableau mm -hmm. would give you the results, uh, talking to the data that is there in Athena um, or or in S3. And um, with, um, well, with respect to the SaaS users, what we did was we had a SaaS Athena connector, so we still store the data in uh, the S3, and we have the Athena connector. Right. To, to SaaS, and SaaS can just talk to Athena in the back end. So you're not bringing data into the SaaS. I mean, you don't longer need to have, uh, I mean, we have like the entire CMS data set, what, 30, 50 terabytes of data. We, don't ha we no longer have to store them on our end. And the biggest benefit that we get, uh, or what we saw was, um, we had a 30 terabyte data set, and the minute we pushed that to, um, AWS and we converted to Parquet, we got a 10x compression. So it became three terabytes. And um, SaaS, traditionally to run the filters on a 30 terabyte uh, data set, used to run for like six to eight hours because it was a single server. And then we spoke to SaaS and they were suggesting a SaaS via kind of solution, which is like a Hadoop kind of environment for SaaS. Right. So it was pretty expensive, 200K, 300K upfront cost. And, uh, but when we tried to pu push that into Athena, I mean, sorry, push that into S3, um, compress that to a parquet, parquet format, and uh, when we ran the query, the entire research query ran in under like a minute or so. It was like, it was mind blowing, and, yeah. um, and I don't think so even our SaaS users would want to go back to SaaS when they saw this, I mean, when they saw the performance. So I think there's a lot of advantage. This, I mean, we need to be careful on how we are kind of marketing these kind of things even within the organization. Yeah. So yeah, I think, uh, I mean, visually and a POC would speak a lot more yeah. than just, you know, like a sales pitch, so. Absolutely, yeah. and I think, you know, it's hard to argue when you just, your mind is blown by just an increase in ease. And, and that's what I wanna zoom in on next. So Michael, what I love about the diagram that you provided me was the emphasis here on the patient and making it easy for the patient. And you know, we're here in a, we have, 
clinical specialists, we have researchers, um, and now we're bringing in the patient into the discovery loop. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how you know, you're leveraging tech to unify all those different loops of discovery. Absolutely. I, I mean, look, I think when you build technology products and healthcare, it's as much, and, and Sri mentioned this, right? It's as, it's as much about behavioral science as it is life science. Yeah. So what does that mean? How do you build trust with patient communities? How are you transparent? How do you give ownership over, over patients' own data to them? How do you look at health equity in communities that have a lot of good reasons not to trust clinical trials and medical research? How do you have patients participate in the economics and where their data is shared? Um, how do you have patients be part of the journey end to end, right? So, um, and Shoaib said this perfect, right? Data is discovery. And I, I love that theme, data is discovery. And I think if you look at the platform that we've built, there's three degrees to discovery, right? Number one is patient to academic medical center. What can the patient inform that academic medical center clinician, researcher, collectively called an investigator? And what can those investigators report back to that patient in real time? Degree number two, patient to biotech or pharmaceutical company. They're running clinical trials for the unique subtypes of rare diseases. The companies struggle to recruit and find patients for those clinical trials. And the companies invest a lot of economics into finding patients, into understanding the data, into understanding biorepositories and registries and baseline data. So how can you start to find economics in the equation? So nonprofits like us, the fundraising doesn't just become do a gala, run a marathon, ask for donations every month. You know, we've pioneered a way uh, of investing as a nonprofit called venture philanthropy. So when we invest in research, we have an economic equity upside. So if that's ever commercialized, dollars come back to the foundation to fund more research until we cure the disease. So how can we look to do that in data as well? Um, then you also have you know, patient to patient as that third degree of discovery. And I mentioned this earlier, but we forget the mom that has a four-year-old with recessive dystrophic EB and has learned 100 ways to bandage their child sometimes has more information and knowledge yeah. than the academic medical center they're being treated at, right? And all three of those degrees can inform the others, right? So when we think of data as discovery, we can build technology platforms to accelerate this. So, you know, really simply put, what have we built? You know, we tried to think about patient behavioral science, behavioral economics, make it very simple and easy for a patient. We wanted the registration to be under 10 minutes because anything over 10 minutes, you start to lose any human being, much less a patient who's very busy who has a child with a rare disease. So patient logs into the platform, uh, either app or um, uh, desktop based. You know, they click a button, do you have genomic sequencing? Yes or no? Yes, would you be willing to upload it? No, would you want this done for free? We send a kit to their house, they scan their cheek, that goes to Stanford, Stanford consults them on their genomics, and they decide where they want to share that genomic information, right. right? Then they fill out a brief survey that has basic information that can inform their engagement moving forward. You know, what's your journey with the disease? What is the academic medical center that you're treated at? What is your subtype? What are the key issues for you? And that informs a longitudinal journey in the same way that you get alerts on your social media app. Bing, did you know that there's a clinical trial that's a fit for your child? Bing, did you know there are a parent that's just registered that has a child in a similar age that wants to connect with other parents just like you? Boom, another alert. Did you know there was a medical research study just published that's your unique subtype, collagen 7A of EB, right? So you create that web of resources, you know, connecting patients to other patients, connecting patients to resource libraries, some generated by academic medical centers, some, you know, crowdsourced from patients themselves. Um, you connect them with clinical trials, they raise their hand and volunteer, I want to be connected to a clinical trial, which solves probably the biggest market barrier in rare disease clinical trials is finding the patients who are willing to participate. Um, and then simple things like, hey, I just had a child that was diagnosed with epidermal lysis bullosa. I've never heard those words in my life. Where do I go? Another alert. By the way, did you know within 100 miles there's two specialists on your unique subtype of EB that we recommend you connect with, right? So with simple data and simple information, really connecting patients to degrees of discovery to curate their journey with a rare disease. That is such a great point, too, and connecting people. Remember that when we're talking about different kinds of data, sometimes we don't even know if we're connecting, if you know, one piece of data belongs to patient A and another piece of data belongs to patient B. What if patient A and patient B are the same person? Right? And I think that that's something the ACR also has, has quite a bit of experience with. That's the biggest challenge because we collect data from 7,000 different sites. Oh my gosh. So 
we have our piece of software running in so many different sites, and then uh, we directly connect to their PAC systems, and we get all of this data. And, and not only that, we also have so many different applications. And let's say there's a facility. Um, I mean, a facility can actually take any of our services. And over the years, we've built so many applications. But when a facility calls, we don't know. I mean, at one point, we didn't know what services they actually were taking from ACR. Um, we didn't know our customers, because a customer A would, be, would have an ID 1 in one of the systems, and they would be ID 10 in another system. How do you know that they are the same? Right. Right? So that, that's where AI and ML comes into picture. Mm -hmm. um, Initially, I mean, they've gone on those days where we use like a SQL-like clause to join names, and because it's much more than that, because the names can be uh, the names can be misspelled. Um, so there's a lot more that you can actually um, do to classify the data. So we use, uh, I mean, AWS's on top of the data. I mean, AWS has on top of the data lake they have something called as find matches, which is amazing because um, we can actually uh, run an NLP on top of the data set that we put in the data lake. So that would match, for example, we do this for the, for the, for the facilities today. Mm -hmm. We bring the facility information from like 10, 15, 10 or 15 systems, and, the, um, and then we do a pattern matching, like NLP matching based on the facility name, the address, their phone number, who the key person is. Wow. And then it basically, you know, kind of finds a unique ID for the set of mm -hmm. facilities, and we, and we find out the master facility ID. The same thing with the master patient index, which mm -hmm. we are working on. Um, so it's kind of very interesting. I mean, things that we were not able to do a few years ago, we are able to do mm -hmm. so now. Yeah. And it is extremely powerful because when somebody calls in, then we would know our customers way better than we did years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So. I mean, the fact is we're all seeing this ability to connect dots, yeah. apply novel services right. to answer questions that we've been grappling with for 100 years yeah. in this space. Right. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. And so I know that we have some folks in the audience who are probably thinking, you know, I have somewhere between a 20 and 100 year old organization that I need to help modernize. And so for three groups, you know, I, I say we, we're all at different stages in your cloud journey. We embrace clouds at different points in your organization's journey. You know, is there, um, what was your first big step? You know, and I'd love to ask this of all three of you. What was your first big step in saying, hello organization, we need to really make this jump? Let's start with um, Shoaib. Yeah, so so that's that's a good question. I I think uh, perhaps there were some big steps, but lots of like small steps to get there. <laughs> so so but um, but I I think for us I think the biggest realization for that you know we can we we just cannot scale in our internal data center right because our problem space is be becoming so much bigger than than our internal capacity right. So once you get the realization, then you start to think about, okay, we know that we have a problem, right? So now the question is that how we go about solving it, right? Uh, for us, the, I think the big challenge for uh, Allen students still is, is that, you know, we have a lot of like, legacy stuff, right? We, we de developed over, I don't know, over last 20 years. And a lot of that was developed not thinking about a lot of like modern cloud technologies and modern technology in some extent. The question is that how you sort of transform your legacy into into the more cloud cloud friendly way. So, so the, what we have been doing, like taking baby steps towards it, right? Let's identify some important use cases which absolutely need cloud first. So we are going to target those applications. We're going to move those to clouds. And then let's look at the second batch, and hopefully we can go the step by step approach to go there. But I think for us, just to realize that we, are the, we, we just don't have capacity anymore, both in compute and storage, so we have to do something. So that was the main thing for us. Awesome. How about you, Michael? I, you know, I learned from a lot of mistakes early on, you know, and, and wasted a few years. The, the first learning experience was I picked the wrong academic medical center that couldn't move as fast as we and patients needed to, and I spent a lot of time trying to get buy-in, a lot of time trying to convince. Um, so that was sort of learning experience number one. Learning experience number two, for some reason, uh, I, I still can't explain to this day, I was like, you know what, one didn't work, I'm gonna go to all 20 
at once, uh, all 20 academic medical centers at once, which the definition death by committee didn't work. And it, it was funny because one of the um, investigators, uh, one of the doctors, NEB, was kind of saying, like, I, we can never put healthcare data on Amazon. How, how could we trust Amazon? Like, this is crazy. And then two weeks later, that same clinician came back to me and said, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I talked to my tech team. Our entire hospital is run on AWS, right? So it was kind of this challenge. And then, you know, but that led me to learn finding the right academic medical center was the biggest learning experience. And, and I mentioned this earlier. We found Stanford School of Medicine in the heart of Palo Alto, tech savvy, wanted to move quick, big EB center, saw a lot of patients, shared the vision, shared the mission. Um, and got everything approved by uh, Institutional Review Board, which validated everything we were doing from a compliance perspective on the platform. So that was a really big learning experience. I could have saved two years for all of you that are thinking about this, save a couple years and get to the right academic medical center first. And the other thing is, is you know, the art of the possible with AWS. And I'll admit, like I, I thought it was all kind of Kool-Aid in the beginning, I met with the AWS team, and the learning experience was, was find great teams. And I'll take the opportunity to shout out the AWS team, of course, Aaron, thank you, uh, RF Khan, Ryan Jankatis, Scott Glasser, you know, there's really good team members and they came to me and they said, look, uh, and it was Envision Engineering at the time, we're going to build you a proof of concept in eight weeks, right? And we're going to go really fast and we're going to get all your stakeholders involved. And I was like, yeah, you know, yeah, right. Like, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it. But it really was remarkable finding the right team within AWS that could build something really quick because that's another great learning experience. You can talk and talk and talk all day about the technology platforms that you're building, but it doesn't resonate with your board, it doesn't re resonate with the patient community, it doesn't resonate with your donors until you show them. So having that proof of concept, that rapid prototype build with Envision Engineering as part of AWS to say, this is what we've built, uh, we, we got buy-in like that. It was no longer an idea, it was tangible, you could see it, you can feel it, and, and really breathe it. So yeah, a couple learning experience from, from many, many mistakes. I mean, I think we should all learn from Michael, because clearly he has just gone from zero to 50 in no time at all. Um, and so let's see here, we are saying big leap into cloud. The first is to, have, to look at your data and your capacity with real eyes. The second is to find the right partners. How about you, Shri, what was your first leap? I mean, for us, there was a lot of hesitations for even going to the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. the, the initial reaction was no. I mean, we are a nonprofit. I mean, it's going to be expensive. What are you talking about? This is, you know, and, and it's healthcare data. I mean, similar to what Michael said. I mean, so for us, the biggest deal was to make sure that uh, we go to the board and we get the board, board, board approval and get the dollars. Um, and uh, initially, I did not get any dollars to work on the data lake because we know, I mean, as a data person, you know that that is the right solution. And obviously, we would have to, uh, I mean, a POC really, really helps uh, to kind of get those additional dollars or to get the dollars to basically fund the project. But I would uh, also say we found innovative, creative ways to find dollars in order to run even our POCs. Uh, we won the Imagine Grant. Uh, we applied for the Imagine Grant. We won the Imagine Grant. We worked with AWS. We did $0 SOWs, which I've never heard of before, but <laughs> uh, we did that twice. Um, and we were able to get our POCs for free, in fact. Mm -hmm. And we were able to showcase what ACI was not able to do for years. We pulled in data sets from um, the government sites, the CMS, the, the health.gov, um, and then we, we kind of merged that data with the data that we had on-prem, like with the radiology data, with the medical uh, imaging data. We kind of created like a dashboard where ACI has never seen that before. So I think it's two things. One is finding creative ways to run your prototype mm -hmm. and then showcase the prototype. The minute we showcase that prototype, um, people kind of understood. And then we basically said, this particular POC, if we had to do with the resources that we had on-prem, these are all the steps that we had to do. But you know what? We didn't do any of that. How do you like it? So it was an easy sell from, yeah. from then on. Yeah. And still, so showing, showing and doing is so important. And um, I will take our last minute here uh, to speak of creative ways to find uh, support. So for those of you who are interested in really trying to, to execute something in cloud, the first place I'd love you to explore is the Health Equity Initiative. So this is a $40 million multi-year commitment from AWS that is aimed to help our customers use cloud to advance health equity globally. So this is application-based. It is 
open to anybody who wants to apply. Uh, and actually, we have a funding round that will close in the middle of January. So I would strongly recommend that you check out the Health Equity Initiative. The other, uh, the other creative way to find some support would be the AWS Imagine Grants. So ACR and uh, EBRP are Imagine Grant awardees. We have two categories of uh, Imagine Grant. This is an incredible opportunity for nonprofit organizations to get support in the form of credits um, and technical expertise uh, for, for anybody who wants to execute a, an incredible project in the cloud. So with that, I'm exactly at zero minutes. I want to thank our speakers again and thank you for your time and uh, have a great day.